it's every parent's nightmare to have your child die before you. On the other hand, it has been an awesome experience to watch his life unfold. Well, he, Noah was your typical first child. I was there when he was born. He was born by cesarean, and we went through the whole childbirth classes thing. So I was there when they pulled him out. When he was born, he was immediately, his eyes were wide open, and he was looking around. He was just so alert. He was a very active boy. It was hard to keep tabs on him. Very curious all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was your typical firstborn. Talked early, walked early, tore his crib apart trying to get out of it. You know, typical firstborn boy. Uh, always had a love for heights. We uh, caught him one time. Uh, we, we lived in an apartment in Berkeley, California while we were missionaries there. And there was a flat roof in the back of this big house that we managed. And uh, one time uh, we caught the little rascal. He was out there walking around on that roof and there was no guardrail. And he was about, you know, two feet high, just a little toddler. And he was out on this plastic roof that was kind of, you know, sagging as he walked on it. And we got him back in and anyway, so he was very adventuresome into everything, interested in everything, uh, aggressive, um, just seemed to have kind of that leader dominating personality, you know, very, very much, uh, very much so, but he was a delightful guy. Well, Rosalie is from Northern Michigan, Bel Air, and I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. And fortunately, we met shortly after we became Christians in Memphis, Tennessee, got married in 77. And uh, our Noah, uh, the son that, that went missing, was born in 1980. Uh, March the 10th of 1980 and uh, then God called us to be home missionaries we moved to California San Francisco Bay and Noah was a little guy we put him in the rental truck and and drove from Memphis Tennessee to California that was an exciting time got stuck a couple of times up in the mountains and made it down into the bay and lived there for the next four years and our next two children were born uh, uh, Josiah and Caleb, who is in law enforcement out in Texas, were born there. And then in 84, we moved back to Tennessee. And then in 88, we moved up here. So um, yeah, we've lived the last 25 years in northern Michigan. It's our home. Noah graduated from high school in Sutton's Bay. And so we've been in the area for quite a while now. Uh, when he was in the third grade, I think it was, he, uh, the school that he went to, he started going to school in Memphis, and the school that he went to was about five miles away. And it was a different time. It was a safer time in Memphis anyway. So he asked permission from us. He wanted to walk home from his school. And it was a busy part of a big town. And so we set safety parameters up, and we let him walk home. And that's just the kind of a guy he was. He was eight years old at he that time. He was eight years old. He just was independent and he struggled in school. Uh, he was he was diagnosed as being ADD and kind of struggled with, you know, keep being organized, keeping track of his stuff. But he, you know, he had drive. He 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 had some goals and he was an excellent writer. And uh, the, the school had uh, a yearly magazine called Exposures where kids could put in you know, uh, poetry or uh, writings or drawings or paintings or, you know, pieces of work. He was in that for four years straight. He was an excellent writer. And he worked hard to work. He started working, taking care of horses uh, for a neighbor. And when he was probably nine years old, no more than 10. And it was amazing. They had this big stallion horse, Mr. Pride, like, you know, nine feet tall at the head, huge, mean varmint, black, jet black. And Noah would go into that horse's stall, and he figured out he could take a pea shooter and trick that varmint and get him out of that stall so he could clean his stall. And it would have scared me to death. I mean, he did things as a child that I was timid, that I would be timid to do as a man. He was just that way. 
we had a, a tight knit family. We loved each other. We had the same struggles that a lot of families did. I think Noah had a big influence on his brothers. He was a pretty dominant personality and made a commitment to Christ as a young child. I can remember him uh, s singing at the top of his voice on the steps of our home in Albany, California, just kind of preaching to the world. And it, we didn't teach him to do that. He just kind of naturally did that. In high school, he was just really chewing on those kinds of things. And, and because he did not experience the reality of God in his life personally, mm. um, he was making some really um, strong statements that alarmed me. Um, that he thought he could do things better than God. And we, we were typical manipulative Christian parents. We <laughs> made him go to all these things that were Christian things. and When he was in high school with oh, us, yeah. It was like, we gave uh, him a choice of either, all right, Noah, all you boys have to do this. You either go to a week-long Bill Gothard seminar or you can do a, week, uh, a weekend-long uh, Emmaus Walk Chrysalis mm -hmm. weekend. And he cho chose the, thor the shorter of those two choices so he wouldn't have to be tortured for a week long. And uh, he, he really, um, he was very angry at God, an angry person at that time in high school. And he, he alarmed his um, small group person at that uh, Christmas weekend. Uh, they didn't know how to deal with this guy. He's very able to debate and discuss in his mind, his logic. Mm -hmm. He was looking for somebody to debate with him mm -hmm. and to try to give him some answers about God mm -hmm. in his mind mm -hmm. because his heart hadn't found any answers yes, in God. God, the reality of personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we, we had been involved with the Minister's Association in Leelanau County for some years and we're friends with the ministers who were in that. And um, one of the pastors of the churches in, in Sutton's Bay uh, was a special friend of ours and he was the leader of that Christmas weekend that mm -hmm. Noah was at. So he, when he heard about this individual, this young person who was just really throwing out some heavy duty doubt questions that the other people in a small group kids were listening to, um, that man, Marty Culver, um, he went to Noah and he said, you know what, let's talk about this. And how about if we set up, would you like to set up an appointment so that we get together once a week over the next few weeks and we talk about your questions that you're wrestling with about God and the reality of God. Mm -hmm. And he really appreciated um, mm -hmm. Marty being willing to listen to him and set that up. So that was really good. He deeply respected Marty. Mm -hmm. um, and they discussed these various things that Noah was wrestling with about the reality of God. Mm -hmm. And it didn't change Noah's mind, but just to know that there was an adult who had listened to him mm -hmm. meant a whole lot to him. Mm -hmm. Noah, again, had been enthusiastic about his relationship with God as a child. And um, when he got into school, that began to be more of a struggle. Be, you know, began to uh, to be a teen and focus into being an adult. And uh, uh, he just found it difficult, I think, to connect with God as an adult. When he was a senior in high school, he made a decision to be baptized, and I think he was looking for something that he could do to connect with God as an adult. But by the time he got into um, the Marine Corps, by the time he got into the Marine Corps, he put atheist on his dog tags. And we have the dog tags. But then the strange thing was, when we talked to him about Christmas presents, he'd say things to us like, hey, can you guys find me some of the old hymns? He said, I want strong hymns with male voices and uh, he liked uh, a mighty fortress as our God. So, you know, there, there just was uh, a struggle, a disconnect. But we were very open with him about our faith, and he was very open to us. And, you know, he was a great guy, a very honorable man, but he just 
found it very difficult, I think, to to acknowledge that he needed a savior as a, as a man, I think, perhaps. So, yeah. So he graduated, and he was the kind of a guy, he was ready to go and go out into the world. And so he went to CMU for two years. And then in the meantime, while he was gone, we moved to Lake Ann from Sutton's Bay. And then he went to Michigan State for a couple of years. And that, again, was unfortunately not a very good fit. He told us he'd go out and go running and uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, uh, you know, and he'd come back and people would be laying around stone, you know, on dope and say, hey, oh, man, what are you doing? You, you're nut, you know, and that, that turned out to be, he wanted to go. His mother had graduated from there, but it did not turn out to be a good place for him. And after two years, he had had enough. He came back home with us, and then plan B was always the Marines. And uh, we had, you know, that was a concern when they were 18 because we know the reality of war. And so we had advised the kids to go to school first. But by the time he was 22, you know, we, we felt that, you know, certainly if that's what he wanted to do, we'd support him. So he joined the Marine Corps in January of 03. One of the reasons why we had hope that he might be alive was he really did have an independent beautiful, in a sense, independent nature. He went into boot camp, uh, told us when he left that, you know, Mom and Dad, you're not going to hear from us for the next 20 years. The boot camp, the Marines are going to be my new home. Well, after six weeks, we got a phone call from them or a letter? Phone call. A phone call. And bless his heart, <laughs> they broke him down. He couldn't wait to get out and get home. He was so... You know, he apologized all over the place and, and just realized that, you know, family is family and it's difficult to find a substitute for that. We went out to San Diego, watched him graduate, uh, his brothers and Rosalie and I. And he started in the Marine Corps and he really liked it. And it took him a while to kind of resign himself to, well, you know, I thought that this was the reality, but this is the, is the reality. But I think in the Marine Corps, he, uh, some good things for him, uh, you know, Noah loved a fair fight. And we found out afterwards that a couple of times he just, you know, if he had a conflict with somebody, he, what he'd love to do is just pick a place and have a fist fight and settle it. And when you're in the Marine Corps and you're enlisted, that's the way you solve conflicts. Real simple. And even the officers sometimes will just, guys get fighting with each other, they just put boxing gloves on them. And, you know, the winner gets... <laughs> wins the gets the resolution of the conflict, and he really took well to that. He was participated in the first battle for Fallujah, in '04, uh, when the the Islamic insurgents uh, murdered those American contractors and burned them to death and hung them up on the bridge. Then his unit was rushed from Okinawa, and just pushed right into combat to try to restore order. So he was in that battle, and then uh, he came home from that. And then it was like a home six months and back in Iraq six months. So he was there three times. And the third deployment, he was injured. Uh, he was in a Humvee and a, a suicide car bomber pulled up next to their Humvee and detonated. So he was injured, but fortunately uh, no one was, was, perma you know, was permanently injured. He had some hearing loss from that. All those times Noah was in Iraq, my Mother Heart would say when I would get a chance to talk to him, Noah, why aren't you in contact with us more? Noah would also tell me, yeah, Mom, but there was a, I walked down to where the shack was, where the computer stuff was, and there was a long line of guys, and I just didn't feel like hanging around there waiting for my line, my, my turn in line. And I said to him, but Noah, <laughs> what, you know, we, we don't know if something's happened to you, and so we're worried about about that and, and besides that I love you I just want to hear from you and he said he got kind of exasperated as a, a grown man will do even a young man will do and say mom if something happens to me the authorities will notify you and if you don't get notification I'm fine so he was not going to own any of my concern for him or his responsibility that he wasn't following it, it through on. Wasn't getting involved in your codependence, was that's he? That's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. 
the Marine Corps ended up being really, I think, the place that he felt, he finally found a home as an adult in the Marine Corps. I think that's safe to say. He made some good friendships. I think he found that sense of honor, that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging. He found a place that really pushed him physically to be his best, a place that was black and white. Uh, and I think perhaps if he'd gone in a little bit younger, he might have stayed in. He, he really, I think, thought long and hard about whether to stay in, whether to get out. And so we are really grateful to the Marine Corps. It, it had a, in many ways, it had a very positive impact on his life. Uh, we later found out that, you know, we were praying, of course, because we wanted to see his life yielded to God. He was such a great guy. You know, the main issue was his life was not yielded to God. And we were praying, and we found afterwards God put him in a proximity with all kind of Christian folks. And that was awesome, too. But we didn't really realize that necessarily at the time, but we sure did afterwards. We were praying that, well, the through the that first of all God would use the Marines to get Noah's attention uh, and <laughs> break that strong will of his that said, you know, I could do a better job than God. Basically, there's people hurting all over this world and and tyrants in control in countries and people really um, being oppressed. So we were praying that God would use the Marines to break that will down, you know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when he went off to the Marines, we, were, we began praying that God would bring other Christian Marines around him to share the reality that, that they had with mm -hmm. the Lord God. And we didn't, he did come home one time and, and he did say, you know, Mom and Dad, and he had this kind of sheepish smile on his face and he said, you know, I, I know you've been praying for me and I don't believe in prayer because I don't believe in God, but actually there is this guy who has been talking to me about um, Jesus Christ and about God and um, we have some good debates and he told me to tell you that <laughs> he is praying for me and he is engaging me in conversation so I'm passing the message on mom and dad <laughs> and as we heard from Noah's Marine Corps friends um, apparently he would tell them about us that we were hardcore, hard-headed Christians, and <laughs> which was kind of fun. So yeah. that was good to know. I, I came to a point of just being so concerned over Noah um, and where he was in Iraq. Those three times were very dangerous places. Mm, yeah. And he was able to tell us, and he showed us pictures about what he was going through and. Mm -hmm you know, on duty for 12 hours at a time in 115 degree heat mm -hmm. with body armor on, um, uh, danger everywhere. And mm -hmm. we were praying for his safety, but I came to a certain point where I said, oh, Lord, if we're blocking, if my prayers are blocking you from doing the work in Noah's heart where he needs to come to the end of himself and realize he cannot, he needs to look up. He needs something above himself. He needs to mm -hmm. find you. Lord, if, if my prayers for his safety have been blocking you from doing what you want to do and know he needs done in his life, then Lord, I just release him to you. And please, God, just don't take him before he surrenders to you. We want to see him in heaven with us when you take us, Lord. And That was that was a struggle to come to in my heart to release him to the Lord. So from that time forward, pretty much I've been praying that, um, Lord, whatever you and your great wisdom know, um, it's going to take for him to surrender to you. I just release his safety to you and trust you, Lord. Mm -hmm. So he, he was protected from that explosion that he was in, that mm -hmm. the, the um, SUV filled with bombs, uh, suicide bomber that mm -hmm. came right up, drove right up alongside their vehicle. Mm -hmm. Noah was the machine gunner in the top, in the turret on top of the vehicle. So he wasn't completely protected. He was, he was vulnerable. He was manning the 50 caliber machine gun on top. And um, 
when the guy blew up the, his vehicle, I mean, it's a miracle. God mm-hmm. did a miracle. None of the men was seriously injured inside the vehicle, nor Noah. He was, they were all knocked unconscious. The doors were blown off from the up-armored Humvee. Um, one guy woke up a few moments later and his pants were on fire. Um, and they, they survived, all of them, mm-hmm. with no major injuries from mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. incredible explosion. Mm-hmm. And we knew that God had protected him and his buddies that mm-hmm. were with him in that vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't change Noah's mind. <laughs> yeah. And then he got out in 07, uh, April of 07, and uh, <laughs> told us that he was camping. Well, basically, he was living out of his car for six months. Looking for a job, you know. In a rest area. In a rest area, yeah. By the highway. By the highway, yeah. Southern California. In Southern California. But uh, he ended up landing a job with the LAPD as a police officer, and he went to police academy. He started in December of 07. And we went out and watched him graduate. Noah, you know, got through the LAPD. Uh, he joined the California National Guard about the same time he was in the LAPD. He uh, was activated to go to Kosovo in 2008 through the California National Guard. And he was just about to go when he had a training accident in Indiana and he injured his knee and he had to have knee surgery. So his group went over, he did not, he stayed here in the States. Ultimately had surgery in Fort Knox, we saw him. Uh, went back to Los Angeles, knee was finally good enough to to go back in active duty with the LAPD. And then in May of 2010, he, May or June of 2010, uh, he had a, he had a, an incident, he was still in training, he wasn't tenured, there was an incident where he felt really, um, um, our, Noah had a real high sense of honor and he felt like he got into an incident where there was no way outside of his control that there was no way he could win and he ultimately on his own decided that he needed to resign. So he called us in June, early June of 2010 and told us that he had made that decision to resign. And that was really frightening. It was like, for me, it was like a, a sword just went through my heart because I realized he'd worked so hard and it was such a good deal for him to be there. And it really did set off a lot of alarms about, you know, golly, you know, what is this going to mean for him? So he decided to stay there in Los Angeles and it took two months for the paperwork to unwind and for him to get all his finer, final paperwork. and kind of get totally disattached from the LAPD. We found out later that in the meantime, he was going out to the mountains in Southern California and going day camping every day. But we um, convinced him to bring his items home. He told us what he had decided to do was to uh, activate with the National Guard, probably go overseas, go back in the military. That sounded like a reasonable plan. Noah also, when he resigned from the LAPD, um, and as he figured out, what, what do I want to do next? Um, he said, Mom, I think on one of these phone calls we had, he said, I, I, I think I'm just going to take all my stuff to Goodwill or someplace like that. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I, I knew a little bit of what he had stashed in his back closet. He never throws anything away. Mm-hmm. He just puts it in this back walk-in closet and it was all sitting there. We'd seen it there once before. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, man, don't give it away. <laughs> Bring it home. And that way I get to see you and we can sort through things and we, we would get to see you. So he thought about it and um, um, he decided he would do that. So he rented a, a cargo van from um, in Los Angeles and drove across country with all of that stuff. And uh, it took him, I think he said, three days. Uh, it took him shorter than he thought it was going to take to get to Traverse City. And he got here on a Monday night uh, to Traverse City, and he, he thought maybe it was too late to call us, and it was two days before he had said he would be here. 
So he called us the next morning and he said, I, I just stayed in this place called the Great Wolf Lodge, Mom and Dad. And it just looked like a fantastic lit up place when I came in in the dark to Traverse City. And I thought, wow, this looks like a good place. And then he woke up in the morning and it's all these kids running around. Here's the single Marine guy. He feels totally humiliated that he's chosen a place where he doesn't fit in at all. And so he checks out of there as fast as he can. I said, well, come on over. Oh, it's so glad you've got here. Come on home. And he said, nope, I told you I was going to be here on Wednesday. This is uh, now Tuesday morning, so nope, I'm not coming over until I told you I would. And I'm thinking, this is so strange. What is going on in his mind? But um, he ended up, in order to save himself some money with the cargo van uh, rental, um, his dad suggested that at least he bring the stuff over. He could unload them into the basement, all of his 19 foot lockers, and um, turn in the van a day early. And so he thought that was a good idea. So we did see him on that day, on that Tuesday. Um, he was just very cheerily unloading. I mean, hard work was not something that he shirked or complained about. He just, sure okay, enough. sure enough, and he'd do it. And, um, Josiah and Mike helped him some too. Then he went, drove off, and turned in the van. And uh, <laughs> we had to wait till the next day to see him and, and bring him into the home. So Noah arrived August the 16th of 2010 at our home. He spent almost 10 days with us, a week to 10 days. And then we had a great time. We went, uh, Josiah was here, Caleb was not. But we had a great time together. Life was very busy uh, at that time. And, uh, but anyway, we, we um, and stressful, had a lot of things going on that summer. So he seemed happy. The boys, whenever they do come and visit, we say, okay, let's make a list of things you wanna do while you're with us. And uh, tops on his list was to uh, go shooting with us. So, we called around and we thought, you are such a city boy living in Los Angeles. Look at you. He, he really wanted it to be an indoor shooting range. And the, there was only one in Traverse City and it had closed on. It was no longer functioning. So Mike called around uh, and found one in Charlevoix that would allow us to come. That was an outdoor shooting range. Without being members, we could just come and pay extra and be there. So... We did, and we had a wonderful time with him. And he's so gentle and um, patient with us. And he had brought a number of his weapons home, and he was leaving them with us. And so he wanted to show us how to use these different weapons. And he's all excited about this kind of stuff, you know. So uh, he makes sure that he buys the ear guards and the eye goggles and stuff for us. Josiah, Mike, and I to go shooting with them. There was a couple shooting next to us in the uh, range right next to us, and um, they were observing us, and when we had a break, I started chatting with the wife, and she was saying, oh yeah, well, who is that guy that is teaching you guys, um, that's just doing such an awesome job? And I said, well, that's my son. And she said, no, no, I mean the guy that's teaching you guys. And I said, oh, well, I have two sons here, and the guy that's teaching us is our son also, and he's uh, a former Marine, and he's um, just resigned from the Los Angeles Police Department, but that's our son. She said, oh, wow, he's awesome. He's so, so gentle and patient with you all. I thought he was a professional. So, made me proud of my boy. <laughs> Then we had a, a time of going out in our boat, too. It's just a little tiny fishing boat that Mike and Josiah own together. And as we're out in this boat, I love nature. And my boys, I love, you know, through, through our years of growing, raising them up, we had gone out on excursions and little hikes and stuff. And here we are, and Noah and I are sitting on the same seat thing in this little fishing boat. Josiah on the next one and then Mike in the back running the motor and we're out on this beautiful little lake and Noah has got his earphones over his head and he's listening to music and he's so excited and he said oh mom you've got to hear this 
So he takes his earphones off his head and he puts them on mine and he's listening to um, Wagner's is it Flight of the Valkyries or Ride of the Valkyries. Um, and it's very exciting music. Da 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 da. I'm thinking, Noah, I don't even like motorboats in nature. I like to experience nature itself. You know, this is irritating. Let me experience God's nature here. And so I took them off and I gave them to him. I said, yes, it's a beautiful piece. Now let me be in peace. And he, he wanted me to listen to it again. So he put them back on my ears and I'm thinking, it's my last day before my boy leaves. I'm not going to get mad at him about this. So... He was very excited, and um, we have a picture of him. He, he uh, got out and, as we were beaching the boat and uh, helped guide it in with his, his boots. So um, that's a treasured picture. There were some things that went on during the week that just seemed like this is not normal, and I was very concerned about Noah. We knew he was very depressed when he resigned from the LAPD two months earlier. And um, he was not, he did not seem as depressed while he was with us, but still there were some unusual things that came up while he was with us. And he um, closed down all of his accounts with Amazon, uh, his Kindle, um, where he's an avid reader. So there were, he left his Kindle behind. He, he gave it to his brother Josiah and said he was going to buy a more up to date one. And so he, he said, Josiah, you can have my Kindle. And I, I thought, but Noah, you're such a reader and you're online all the time. His plan, he told us, was to go back to San Diego, report for his weekend of training with the California National Guard and request uh, uh, volunteer to deploy to Afghanistan with the soonest National Guard unit that, was, that he could transfer into to go. So that was what he stated his plan was. And he had a couple of weeks before he needed to report for that weekend of training. So I just thought, well, obviously, Noah, you're not going to be able to be whisked away. And you're, you know, you're going to have, it's going to take you some weeks, possibly a couple of months to pick up orders to um, deploy. So you're going to need your books to read. You're going to need your Audible account to listen to all these iPod lectures you listen to online and music you listen to online. I, I didn't understand. There were big red flags that went up. Um, so, and he said he was just going to live out of his car in the parking lot of the National Guard Armory, Armory in San Diego. And he had done that kind of thing before, and there were showers they would allow them to use. Uh, that was not an impossibility. But I, I also felt alarmed he had no forwarding address that I could send cookies to or, or contact him at uh, because he had moved out of his apartment in L.A., brought all of his things to our house. There were about 19 foot lockers of gear down in the basement. And um, I, I just thought, oh, this doesn't feel good. And so while he was with us, I, I was telling Mike, you know, Mike, this is really alarming. Um, would you please talk to him and ask him if he's considering suicide? So Mike did. While I was in the room at one point, he did ask Noah. And Noah didn't uh, turn all the way around and look at his dad in the face and say, No, of course not, Dad. What are you talking about? He turned halfway around, not facing his dad's face, and he said, um, No, Dad, you don't need to worry about that. And so there were some thing, unusual things while he was with us. We never got down to a level of just relaxation where he told us what was on his heart. A lot of times I would, when he was with us, at some point he'd flop down with his face on the couch and he'd, he'd, he'd say, scratch back, Mom, scratch back, um, just like he used to when he was a little boy. And I would be scratching his back and he'd just be relaxed. And a lot of times he'd just let what was on his heart would come out. We never had a time when he was with us this last time where that happened. Had a great time together, said our goodbyes. Uh, he got in a rental car and headed out to, uh, he got in a taxi and headed out to the airport um, to 
to who to what we thought was going back to San Diego. We'd encouraged him to, hey, you got two three weeks, take the opportunity to stop somewhere, you know, enjoy yourself, see some of the beautiful Western U.S. But that's about all that we knew. He he asked us before he before he left. Hey, do you guys have any suggestions of where I should visit on, on my way across country? And we said, well, your brother Josiah years ago went to Montana and Glacier National Park, and it looks really pretty from the pictures we saw. You might want to think about going up there. And besides that, your cousin John lives in Billings, and we can give you his contact info if you want to visit him. And he's, you know, he didn't sound like he was sure enough. That's what I'm going to do. He just listened and, mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for the suggestions. It was strange that um, we're a pretty pretty tight family, and he knows, all three of my sons know that as much time as we can spend with them. Oh, we just love that. So it was really unusual that he would arrange for a taxi to pick him up at our house to take him to the Traverse City Airport for um, to to rent a car there. And I, I, I said, no, we... We love to spend every minute with you, even the minutes that of driving the 20 minutes to the airport. But he said, no, no, Mom, that's that's what I've decided. And so the taxi driver came about 10 minutes earlier than Noah had said. 10 in the morning was when it was supposed to be. And I, we went out and stood with him in front of the garage and asked the taxi driver if he'd take a picture of us, which he did. So it was... Josiah and Mike and me and Noah, and so we have that picture. And because things seem so strange, some things, and he was taking the taxi, and I took a picture of him leaning in to talk to the taxi driver at one point. And it didn't make any sense. I thought, what am I doing this for? But I don't know, I'm doing it. And we said goodbye. He drove off. I went upstairs to just check through, her, and Josiah found that Noah had left his Swiss watch and some clothes that I had washed that I knew he wanted to take with him. So I called him on the phone, his cell phone, and I said, Noah, um, you left your watch and some clothes that you said you want to take with you. We can, we can, if you agree to stay there at the airport, and I could hear some of the recordings at the airport um, going on. So I knew he was at the airport. And I said, I, uh, we will drive him straight over to you. And he said, no, Mom, I'm, oh, I'm so, you know, I'm disgusted with myself that I left those things behind. But nope, just give them to Josiah. Nope, I'm not going to agree to wait for you to come and bring them. And I said, well, if it's just that you don't want me crying on your shoulder again or something, um, Josiah can bring them to you. And he said, no, no, that's okay. Just let Josiah have them. And I thought, this is so strange. Maybe it's a Marine thing, you know, independence or something. But anyway... That's the last time I talked to him. For the next three days, we did call him some, just left messages on his cell phone. Unfortunately, crisis rarely happened in isolation. And the summer that Noah went missing was, was such a great example. Uh, we, Josiah and I threw a surprise birthday party for Rosalie in May, the end of May. We had been very involved with, I think, five altogether international students, real special students at Interlochen for the past two years. It was five. And they all graduated, or four of them graduated. At Interlochen Arts Academy. At Interlochen Arts, Arts Academy. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of work and effort and prayer into that. We had two brothers-in-law that died that summer. The church that we were involved in was in the midst of a meltdown, what ended up being a split, and that was kind of going down that summer, beginning to. Five days after Noah left, a young family member, a niece, got dropped off at our door, and you know it was kind of an emergency situation. So she was with us for a couple weeks, and uh, ultimately um, there was a good spot that was found for her in the Christian community, and that had a happy ending, but that was very stressful. So there was a lot swirling in the mixer. You know, we could feel guilty about that, but, you know, it was what it was. We were doing the best that we could. Um, and we're so glad that Noah did come home and, and be with us. But there was quite, um, quite a depth of stress 
in a lot of different levels uh, that was happening at the same time. One good thing, Josiah met Ashley at a ball game, at a, a Beach Bums game that summer, and that started their eventual engagement and marriage, and so that was a happy event in that mix. On September the 11th, we were in the midst of the crisis of our young uh, niece, who we were desperately trying to help. And uh, it was Saturday, it was September 11th of all days, received a phone call from Noah Sargent in San Diego, California, California National Guard, who says to me, uh, hey, do you know where Noah is? He didn't show up for drill this weekend. And that was, boy, that, that was really frightening. We didn't have much time to react that day because, again, we were right in the midst with our niece, but um, that was really frightening. For him not to show up for duty was totally unlike him, and we already had had concerns about his behavior before he left. So the first battle there, then that we were up to was that we were up against is, okay, do we do anything? Yes. Do we do anything? Do we and take any action? From the moment that that his sergeant of the California National Guard called us on September 11 and said, uh, where is your son? This is not at all like him. He did not show up for his weekend of training. Mm -hmm. My heart just, oh my goodness, what happened? Did he commit suicide between our house and the airport? We had no idea. Mm -hmm. There was there was no address uh, to find out if he'd gone back to his place. There was no place He'd moved to out check. of his apartment. All he had was a cell phone and a credit card and a driver's license, really, and a few belongings. Right. And yeah. a car waiting back in California. And the story to us that he was on his way to San Diego and he had yeah. two weeks to, yeah. to enjoy life, hopefully, along the way and see some pretty sights. So at some point we decided, hey, we've, we've waited long enough. And I think it was that he missed his second drill. And there was discussion between Rosalie and I back. You know, she wanted to press forward and try to find him right away. And his brothers and I felt that, hey, let's, let's give it a little bit of time. So then we contacted the police, uh, the Michigan State Police. That was frustrating. Tried to get them to issue a missing person report. And uh, that was frustrating. Uh, Finally, after, toward the, I believe the end of October, the trooper was able to at least put in a, write up a uh, complaint from us on a missing person. And once he got that in, the Michigan State Policeman was able to identify and go to the car rental places. We tried to contact him. You know, you really help us in one sense as a private citizen because nobody will talk to you because they can get in trouble if they release information. Finally, um, Rosalie realized that she had yes. taken a picture of that rental car and that the phone number on the rental car was there. The sheriff had contacted the rental car company. Actually, it was the taxi. Taxi, I'm sorry, your taxi company, and had... Uh, and had said, um, and they had denied they had him in the car. They lost their records or whatever. So finally, when he went the second time, they were able to identify that they had picked him up. Then the sheriff was able to identify the car rental company that he'd rented a car from. And we get that information, and it says Kalispell, Montana. We had no idea at that point where in the world Kalispell, Montana was. I'd never even been to Montana. Rosalie hadn't either. So we got on the map, and sure enough, Kalispell, Montana, you can imagine an area 130 miles long and 110 miles wide. That's an area in Montana that's mainly federal parks and state parks, and Kalispell's on the west side, up near the Canadian border, and it's a jumping off port, a jumping off spot for Glacier National Park. So he had rented a car and had dropped that car off at, Cal at Kalispell International Airport. Three days after he rented it. Three days from after City. he rented it from Traverse City. So finally, at the end of October, we had something that told us somewhere about where he might be. But that was all we had. And as it turned out, in another one of God's circumstances, I had already made months before a decision. I have to go in my business, I have to go to a conference every year. 
for two days. And I'd already decided, because I had business in Colorado, to go to the conference that year in Las Vegas. So I went, you know, uh, in the beginning of November. So I went out to go to my conference, but I flew up to Kalispell. And I had a long weekend, basically. And of course, we were praying like crazy. And we had a small prayer meeting at the church where we were going at the time. And some people came and prayed with us. So I showed up, hit the ground, talked to the sheriff, um, put posters up everywhere, spent four days putting up, you know, have you seen Noah Pippin signs with his picture in every place that I could think of, particularly in a place called Columbia Falls, Montana, which was right on the edge of the Glacier Park. I went to the Glacier Park, and you know, I gotta tell you, it was absolutely thoroughly discouraging. Glacier Park is this huge area, and there's only two federal law enforcement officers. And they pulled no punches. They said, Mr. Pippin, we lose three to four people a year out here, and they're never found. And the police were equally as realistic about the chances of Noah's survival. But we had no idea where he even was, just that he'd gone to the airport in Kalispell. So I left, going, went back to my conference, felt thoroughly discouraged. Like, you know, God, I have accomplished absolutely nothing. Well, while I was in Vegas, this lady calls me out of the blue, and she introduces herself, and she says, um, you know, my name is Katie Harris, and I'm from a local TV station, and I happen to see your, your uh, poster about your son, and would you mind if we did an interview? So I did a phone interview with Katie Harris. And uh, Katie has just a, become a dear friend. And uh, she was a news gal uh, at a, I think it was an ABC station in Kalispell. And she saw the poster and she said, hey, what's this about? So she ran a story on the news. And what that did is it launched, you know, it became real clear. The only way we were going to get an answer to our question was by getting the issue before the public. And the only way to get the issue before the public was media. You know, we had to find a way to try to get some kind of interest to get an answer to this. So the answer got in the media. I talked to and I met a man named Pat Walsh when I was in Kalispell, and again, I was by myself. And Pat was a detective, and he, you know, took a real interest in the case. It turns out that he's got a son who is a um, in the Navy and, um, and, you know, was very sympathetic to the fact that Noah was a veteran and was currently in the California National Guard. Um, just, just to yeah. say to Pat Walsh is a detective with the Flathead, Flathead County, County Sheriff's County. Department. Yeah, which is... So we, we were finding it, there's a, the law in Michigan had changed, so the guidelines of the state police here made it so that the state trooper trying to help us was he could not file a missing persons report and he could not put it on the NCIC, National Crime Information System. Yeah. He could not because it didn't fit the guidelines because Noah was an adult. He, it's up to him if he wants to be unknown. Mm -hmm. And he prob the, the trooper felt like he probably was just didn't want to go back to his obligation at the California National Guard. And so he was skipping out. Mm -hmm. And we said, but that's not our son. That is not the way he's ever operated before. It's been very important for him to follow through on his obligations. Nonetheless, after much conversation with the state trooper, he talked to his sergeant and that person um, said, I'm sorry, but we, we cannot open a case. It doesn't fit our criteria. He is not a missing child. Um, he's not been kidnapped. Nobody knows. There's no evidence that uh, he was wrongfully taken hostage. So all we have to go on is that he made up his mind. He doesn't want to be seen for a while. So I'm sorry. He doesn't fit our guidelines. Um, the law changed in Michigan um, just within the last couple of years uh, because we don't have enough state police to follow up on people who are missing. So we have to narrow it down to the most dangerous cases that mm -hmm. look like. Uh, something, you know, a child or a person who's mentally ill mm -hmm. um, is lost. But I'm sorry, ma'am and sir, we cannot help you in this situation in Michigan. So 
in the course of talking with the Callis Bell situation and police up there once we found his car had been turned in, we contacted and Mike got in contact with uh, Detective Pat Walsh of the Flathead County Sheriff's Department and he didn't understand why Michigan couldn't file that complaint but anyway he went ahead and opened it and we had the case mm -hmm. transferred to him and then he filed the NCIC missing persons report on Noah so that now it was all over the United States um, his picture all of his information etc right so if he showed up got a traffic ticket ended up in the morgue was in the hospital whatever he you know they'd pick him up and we'd be notified so that ended up being a major step uh, of course at that point you got to realize we had absolutely no idea where he was or what he had done at all we were totally in the dark other than he'd been in Kalispell on he got into Kalispell on the 27th I think it was yeah 27th he got to Kalispell on the 27th so winter you know Thanksgiving came and went and Christmas came and went and it was tough our son, our youngest son, who's wonderfully practical, and I gotta say that Josiah and Caleb both are believers in the Lord, and we're so grateful that they are, and they're great men. Caleb is very wonderfully practical, tough-minded, commonsensical, and he said, you guys have gotta go through Noah's stuff and see if you can find anything, and we did not wanna do it. We were both terribly depressed. Um, it was just hard to move. And I know, you know, parents that have been through this know how we feel, you know. And all those, I mean, it's down in the dark, spidery basement. There's yeah. nothing interesting in the basement. And <laughs> just piles and piles of these foot lockers. Um, so I just, I had tried to go down there, and Josiah had helped me some to start going through the things. It was an overwhelming. Yeah. I, I just couldn't do it by myself. And Joe and I both, I, I just was overwhelming. So... Caleb kept telling us, that's what you need to do, Mom and Dad. That is how you're going to help find Noah. You're going to go through that. You need to get down there. Mm -hmm. So I, I whined at him. And I said, but you don't understand. It's so discouraging, and it's dark down there, and and there's so much to go through. It's overwhelming, and he, you got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so finally, in January, we, we'd have some sessions of Mike and Josiah and I going down and s begin to sorting through all those foot lockers. And then I believe it was January. In December, January. December, December of 10, January of, of 2011. 2011. Yeah. yeah. We found in a backpack that was stashed in some of the stuff a notebook. And, in, and we looked through it. And in Noah's handwriting, there was the address of the rental car agency here in Traverse City so it was while he was here obviously mm -hmm. that he'd written this note to himself and right under that on the same page was these written directions very detailed directions to walk along the Hungry Horse Reservoir, Reservoir. to yeah. get to the Blue Lakes on the Spotted Bear River yes yes and so we called the detective and it, he didn't even recognize the place to begin with. And he's an experienced backpacker, and he's on search and rescue. There's an area up here, big area, it's Glacier National Park. And we were thinking Glacier National Park, because that's where most people go, because it's, it's more accessible, it's more widely known, it's beautiful, it is rugged. But there's also a bigger area down below that's a natural wilderness. And uh, there's two or three major parks embedded. There's three counties involved. It's so big. And so the Blue Lakes were there on the southern part. He said, that's down in the Spotted Bear Wilderness. And so, so anyway, that gave us hope. It gave us a new focus. We decided, okay, come spring, we're going to go back because to Montana. Yes. Yeah. The also, on the next page of that same notebook in Noah's handwriting was as if it was a hiking. It was a list of things like he was going to take on a hike with them. And there were, uh, we have the list, but mm -hmm. five containers of honey, um, beef jerky, binoculars, two inflatables. I don't know what else. There were a few other items on his list. And we thought, 
this is really unlike him. I mean, here's our our Los Angeles. He's become a Los Angeles city guy mm -hmm. who's saying, I want to be in, shooting in an indoor range, you guys. And and here he is. It looks like he's talking about hiking. It, um, it, it was it looked like a part of his plan that he came up while he was here. And it, and it spoke of his plan to go to this wilderness area in Montana before he left here even. Mm -hmm. It was very puzzling. Mm -hmm. And so we, as Mike was saying, we, we did call the detective and we gave him this information and we faxed him the, the picture of Noah's pages in this notebook. June came. In the meantime, that area had the greatest snowfall they'd had in 50 years. I mean, just tons and tons and tons of snow. We had hoped to go um, in the May, you know, but then we realized, hey, we got to push this back because they're telling us there's been so much snow that winter. So finally in June of 2011, we meet in Bozeman. Caleb flies in from Texas. We fly over from Michigan. By this time, the detective, Detective Walsh, has also found out more because the police in Montana are able to file a missing person report and get him on the NCIC. Now they can go to the judge and get a subpoena to subpoena his credit cards. And they find out that he had spent the night in a place called uh, Hungry Horse, Montana at the Mini Golden Inn. So they knew more, but we still, and, and we had the directions to Blue Lakes, you know, where they connected what we hoped so. Well, it's a 50 mile drive, takes about an hour and a half to drive on a gravel road from uh, Hungry Horse, Montana, down to the Spotted Bear Ranger Station. And the Forest Service lady, Deb Mucklow, there was wonderful. Uh, the, the trailhead, you know, basically got a ranger station and then going out and w spokes of the wheel, there are different trailheads. The trailhead we needed to go out was closed, wasn't open yet because of the weather had been so bad. They opened it for us anyway. We got there at six in the morning and uh, jumped in a pickup truck with a guy and a chainsaw and an hour later, you know, we'd gone six or seven miles and we were finally at the where the trail began. There were trees down. Trees down. So he had to winter. cut those logs and, and the men had to get throw them out of the way out to of get the, the, yeah. the truck to get through yeah. to the trailhead. Yeah. So Caleb and I set off. It was about a five mile trek to Blue Lakes. Um, it's difficult for people that have never been out west to imagine what it's like. I mean, you've got 7,000 foot mountains all around you. Uh, there are bear all over the place. Uh, we could hear things crashing off as we went in. You could see bear footprints and grizzly footprints and scat all over the place. We saw a moose and a caribou in the middle. Tremendous waterfalls coming down. So here we go, Caleb and I. Rosalie stays with the rangers. They give us a radio and bear spray. <laughs> so we go in with uh, bear spray and and uh, uh, radio and prayer. As and I'm coming back after we drop, I, I'm in the truck too to drop them off at the head of the trail that goes into Blue Lakes. Mm -hmm. It's just Noah, or just Caleb and Mike. And so the young Forest Service ranger that is driving the truck, he's taking me back to the ranger station to wait for them. And we see two bear cubs, uh, grizzly bear cubs, just right there um, as we're leaving to go back to the ranger station. And the ranger, she stops and she makes sure her windows are rolled up. And um, she, I just kind of was amazed that she was being so careful then. But anyway, so we get back to the ranger station and while they're hiking in, I'm just kind of walking around and I do take a nice walk uh, across the river on a little trail and come back. Meanwhile, the younger rangers, the seasonal rangers, they're about college age. They're all talking back and forth to each other and saying, hey, why are these people here? The trails aren't opened yet. And so then they get told, you know, they're all talking and well, they're here because their son's missing and they think he might have been here last year. And this young man comes up to me and he says, ma'am, I think I may have seen your son last year. Last fall it was, he said. There was this guy that had like a a floppy military camouflage hat on 
and and he had like military pants on and he he had a, a gallon jug of water he was carrying with him and he was marching along the 25 nay the 50 mile, 50 mile gravel road from hungry horse village to the ranger station and he said i've never seen anybody hike that 50 mile gravel road before so i saw him over the course of several days and i finally stopped and um i asked him hey man what are you doing here and he told me that um something and and i wasn't really listening really close because i didn't think it was noah because noah we had never seen him in any military gear when he was off duty he didn't want to be in it in case some some senior officer or something would find one little thing that was wrong and could criticize him so he just we never saw him in his in his uniform much so I, I thought it probably wasn't no one I listened politely and I didn't ask him any questions I just asked him did well did you give him a ride and he said uh well no I said did you get out of the car to see how tall he was and how you measured up tallness wise to him he said no no I didn't and um, so we, I thanked him, and and that, mm. you know, that's going on while they're while we're searching. In. So we spent all day in, and my son was like a billy goat. He had a GPS on him, and we're back. I mean, we're going up hills like this and back down again. We're climbing up on rocks and trees, and we get to this one spot. And it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen on earth. You can imagine a huge amphitheater hillside. And there are five streams coming down like this. And they ultimately form one. And right in the middle, there was a campground. So Caleb had found where the different campgrounds were in the area. And so we're just going over a hill like this and down and we'll, checking to see if there's any evidence. We carefully check the blue lakes. They're just little lime lakes. They're no bigger than the diameter of the church here. Really small, really. And looking for bodies, you know, looking for any signs of anybody and can't smell anything, we can't see anything. So finally it was time to go home. You know, we, we weren't gonna spend the night and you know, we'd done our mission. We came out, I was so tired, honestly. I couldn't hardly walk, I was so sore. Caleb was very discouraged and I told him at the time, I said, Caleb, you know, cause we prayed before we went and I said, we've just gotta trust God. I said, you know, God may use this in a way that, you know, we can't see. 